So this morning, following on, on our theme this term on the character of God, we're looking at the God we worship. And I'm taking this from Psalm 103 with special thanks to James Jackson. One of the greatest Christian thinkers of the 20th century was an American pastor, A.W. Tozer. You might have heard of him. So in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, he made a stunning statement. He said, what comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I'm going to read it again. What comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Now, that's a pretty epic statement. I mean, really, the most important thing? And I would say yes. And here's why. First, our worship of God will never be greater than what we think about God. If we have a shallow, superficial view of God, then we have a shallow, superficial view of worship. If we think of God primarily as a way for our needs to be met, or maybe our greed to be met, then what we think about God will be depending on if he answers our needs or greeds or not. And if it's inconvenient to worship him, we won't because we don't have that high view of God. Tosa goes on to say that people tend to move toward their mental image of God. People tend to move toward their mental image of God. So let's say that what you think about God is that he exists to make you healthy and wealthy. If that's the case, then you'll move towards God as a means to satisfy your need, which means that you actually aren't moving towards God at all. On the other hand, let's say your view of God is of a demanding, vengeful, wrathful deity who's just waiting for you to make a mistake so he can hurl you into hell. If that's your view of God, you're most likely to keep that kind of a God at a distance, aren't you? And that is why Psalm 103, the psalm we're going to look at today, is so very important. Of all the psalms, Psalm 103 may give us the most complete picture of God's character, of who he is. And if we can really get what Psalm 103 is saying, then it's going to help us from creating God in our own image. So let's turn to Psalm 103 and see from the first couple of verses that true worship begins with God and not with who we are. So these are verses 1 to 5. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my innermost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desire with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So, worship begins with God, not yourself. That's verse 1. David starts with a simple command to himself. He says, Praise the Lord, O my soul. Worship begins with praise, not requests. All my innermost being praise his holy name. We teach our children to say please and thank you, don't we? But in worship, we say thank you first and then please. True worship 
begins by remembering what you have, not what you lack. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So then let's make a decision. When we come to worship God, we're going to tell him how great he is. Now verses 3 to 5 read a little like a job description. On the surface, this just seems to be a description of what God does. We know who God is because of what he is doing. And notice that it doesn't say what God has done, but what God is doing. Each of these verbs in the Hebrew means that it represents an action or condition in its unbroken continuity. It may be used as past, present, or future time. So you get the point. So let's look at these one by one. He forgives sin because he is the one forgiving, Jehovah Salah. David, the author of Psalm 103, knew what it was like to need forgiveness. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we read about his most epic fail. He committed adultery, he got the woman he slept with pregnant, and then he arranged to have her husband killed. In Psalm 51, David wrote, I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Do you know what that feels like? Are you dealing with the guilt and shame of your past? If so, let Hebrew grammar change your life this morning. David says, the Lord forgives, present tense, the Lord forgives all my sins. How many of my sins does he forgive? All of them. He forgives when I asked him to. 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But then we keep on sinning. So, he forgave us in the past. He forgives us in the present. He will forgive us in the future. He heals diseases because he is the one healing. Jehovah Rapha. Did you know that your body is being constantly healed? Rub your arm for a second. Just, just rub your arm for a second. You know what you just did? You just deposited over 100,000 dead skin cells on the floor. <laughs> Your body is a death machine. Isn't that exciting? Your body is a death machine that is constantly being rejuvenated by the Lord. Every seven years, every cell in your body is replaced by a completely new one. God is healing you even as we speak because he is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Some of you may look at a verse like this and say, well, that proves the Bible isn't true. This says God heals all diseases and people die of diseases every day. And that's true. But let me point out two things. First, being healed doesn't necessarily mean being cured. Healing means wholeness. It means you aren't identified by your disease. Your identity comes from who you are in Christ. Second, those who are in Christ are on a timeline that stretches into eternity. We will all experience ultimate healing in the life to come. He redeems us because he is the one redeeming, Jehovah Gael. A third name and third reason David gives thanks is because God is Jehovah Gael. Jehovah Gael is the Lord who redeems. To redeem is to be brought back. 
Do you know what it means to be brought back? Have you ever watched the Father of the Bride movies? In the second movie, George and Nina decide that now that their kids are grown, they're going to move to a smaller place. They're going to downsize. So they sell their house, and then they discover they're pregnant again. They can't stand the idea of the new baby growing up in any house other than the one they raised their first two kids in. So George goes to the guy who bought the house and says, I want to buy my house back. The guy says, sure, I'll sell it to you for twice the price I paid for it. George can't believe it, but he pays back the double price because he can't stand the thought of his youngest child growing up anywhere other than in their family home. The Bible says that Jesus brought us back at a huge price, far more than double our worth. He made us. He knit us together in our mother's womb. But when we grew up, we went our own way. God couldn't stand the thought of us living anywhere other than in the family home. So he sent his son to buy us back. We were brought back. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my innermost innermost being, praise his holy name because he brought me back. He is Jehovah Gael, the Lord who redeems me. He crowns and protects us because he is the one crowning, Jehovah Eta. In the Hebrew, there are two different ways that this verb Eta is used. The first is to crown someone. When David became king of Israel, he was crowned. But the verb is also used to describe the protection of an encircling army. And both of them are true. God both crowns us and encircles us with his loving kindness. Imagine a dad grabbing his toddler and hugging him for all he's worth. That's what our Heavenly Father does to us. He encircles us with his love. He satisfies us. Because he is the one satisfying, Jehovah Sabah. Verse 5 says that God satisfies us with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. How many of us get old and worn out because we're not satisfied? How many of us abuse our bodies because we're trying to find satisfaction in things that are bad for us? But God satisfies us with good. Over and over in the Psalms, God promises to satisfy us with good things. Man and women fell in the garden when Satan convinced them that God alone wasn't enough to satisfy them. So just to recap, it was A.W. Tozer that argued that what we think about when we think about God is the most important thing about us. However, there was actually another great Christian thinker of the 20th century um, that disagreed with Toza. Maybe many of you will be more familiar with C.S. Lewis. This is what C.S. Lewis said. What God thinks about when he thinks about us is the most important thing about us. What God thinks about when he thinks about us is the most important thing about us. Actually, the fact is, I think they're both right. Toza's point was that we can't properly relate to God if we have an improper understanding of who he is. But Lewis's point is that we wouldn't be able to relate to him at all, properly or improperly, if God didn't love us delight in us, pursue us, and seek a relationship with us. So let's finish our time in Psalm 103 by looking at what it says about what God thinks about us. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. 
The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly host, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. We know what God thinks of us because of what he's done for us. So, he works for all the oppressed. Verse 6. God is a God of justice and righteousness, not just for a certain nation or a preferred group of people. Look closely at verse 6. How many of the oppressed does God work justice and righteousness for? All of them. There aren't any qualifiers here. All means all in the Greek and the Latin and the Hebrew and the English and any other language you like to think about. All means all. All means black and white and brown. All means rich and poor. All means whatever political party you support or don't. All means citizen and alien. All means all. He reveals his ways to the ignorant. Verse 7. While God is concerned with those of every tribe and nation, Scripture consistently points out that God has a special relationship with the people of Israel. He made himself known to Moses and to the people of Israel. We are beneficiaries of that because we have been grafted in as a branch. And Romans 11 verses 11 to 31 will confirm that for you. But don't miss the fact that we couldn't know anything about God without God making himself known to us. He forgives the sinful, verses 8 to 10. These are some of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. In Hebrew, the phrase slow to anger literally means long of nose, which sounds a little weird, but think about it this way. Have you ever seen a cartoon of an angry bull? How are they usually pictured? It's like smoke coming out of their nostrils. And often in scripture, when God is angry, he's pictured the same way. So to describe God as long of nose means that it takes him a long time to get angry. 
God doesn't repay us in proportion to our sins. We deserve separation from God forever in hell because of our sin. But God is long-nosed towards us. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For how many of us does God abound in love and not treat us according to our iniquities? All of us. Verses 11 and 12, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Think about this for a minute. How high are the heavens above the earth? Infinitely high. How great, therefore, is his love for those who fear him? Infinitely great. How far is the east from the west? Infinitely far. How far has he moved our transgressions from us? Infinitely far. This is one of the greatest promises in all of Scripture. It tells us that no matter what we've done, God's love for us is bigger than whatever it is. It tells us that no matter how far and how long we've sinned, God's forgiveness for us is further and longer than our sin. Verses 13 to 14, he understands our weakness. Why does God have compassion on us? He knows how we are formed. We're made up of tiny particles of dust, for goodness sake. Verses 15 and 16. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in the field. The wind blows over it, and it's gone, and its place remembers it no more. Our lives are short. Verses 17 and 18, but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. Our lives are short, but his love is long. And verse 19 The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Over how much? All. How much is that? All. So I have a bad day. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. So what can a bad day do to me? What can a person do to me? What can separate me from God's love? If someone gave his life for you, then you never have to question where you stand with them. All the insecurity that comes from wondering how someone feels about you, that's off the table. God has already demonstrated his love for us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. End of discussion. Let's finish with praise. God is so worthy of being worshipped by all of heaven and all of creation. Verses 20 to 22. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding and obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly host, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. 
So what are we going to walk away with from this message? How does this make a difference? I want us to end with three truths from God's word that if we take these to heart, I really believe they will make a difference to how we live our lives today, this week, and all of our lives. So here's the first one. God is who he says he is. God is who he says he is. The second one, God will do what he says he will do. God will do what he says he will do. And the third one, I am who God says I am. I am who God says I am. With these truths in mind, let's worship God with all our innermost being. Let's worship him rather than talk about worshiping him and then see what he has in store for us as we wait on him and minister to one another in the power of his name. So as Mark and Chris come up to lead us in worship, would you focus on those three statements and especially on the one you most need to think about? Let's worship. <laughs> 